So good morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, and I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to speak here and to attend this really stimulating conference. I've learned a lot. I've seen some very good talks. And the down part of that is that that gave me lots of ideas of adding things to my talk. So actually, over the week, I've been adding things to this talk. And the original plan was to talk about exclusively about our barcode initiative in Brazil, but I couldn't resist, so I added a few of our own studies. I'll try to be brief on those particular studies, and I'll be happy to talk about them with you guys um, later on. So this has been a great conference and very well organized, so thank you very much for the opportunity, and thank you for being here after that very nice party last night as well. So my focus of research is mammals. Uh, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time convincing you that mammals are cool and charismatic and interesting. But maybe I should try to convince you that they are scientifically as interesting as other groups that have been uh, you know, proposed here as very uh, you know, attractive targets for research. So mammals don't have such a huge diversity. They have only 7,000 named species, but their disparity is amazing. So the diversity of forms, ecomorphological adaptations is, is astonishing. So the largest range in size among all, among all animals, about eight orders of magnitude in size range, multiple evolutionary radiations in different places, a lot of convergence, and we're now at the stage where we can look at the genomic basis, for example, for adaptations for ant eating in different groups, for flying in one group, for aquatic living in other groups. So we're at the verge of being able to really probe into mammalian evolution in an unprecedented way. I've been involved for over 15 years with trying to resolve the phylogeny of mammals. So over 15 years ago, we resolved most of the branches above the order level, and we've been working on fine-tuning this tree. This is one of the, these are the trees we published about 14 years ago, and this tree here is one that we published four years ago, trying to resolve uh, family-level relationships among mammals and timing those diversification events. And that gives us a good framework upon which we can look at you know, diversification processes, biogeography, and genomic adaptation. Uh, within mammals, my main focus are the carnivores, the carnivora, it's a, one of the orders, modestly diverse but in terms of species, but very uh, uh, disparate in terms of form and function, lots of different adaptations. Um, and this, of course, is a very familiar group with dogs, cats, bears, uh, walruses, and others. And within carnivores, most of my research has been on neotropical taxa. My group has been working for over 10 years in various phylogenetic, phylogeographic, population genetic projects, molecular ecology, including the use of DNA barcodes to identify prey items and the carnivores themselves in remote locations, and moving more and more towards genomics. Our main project right now focusing on carnivore genomics is the Jaguar Genome Project. So this uh, is the, the Jaguar we picked. It's a male from the Pantanal called Firefly. So it's called Vagalume in Portuguese. It's in a zoo. It's a really cool animal. We've sequenced its genome at very, fairly high coverage. And we're now using this genome as a reference for a, a variety of studies, including not only comparisons with other mammals and how the Jaguar genome is structured, <clears throat> but also population level analysis using exome capture. So we designed an exome capture aid to capture about 18,000 genes from across the Jaguar's genome, 36 million bases more or less, and we're sampling it in over 100 wild Jaguars from different locations, looking at genes involved in adaptation and genes involved in phenotypes. And this is relevant, of course, for conservation. I didn't mention in the first slide, but mammals are among the most threatened taxa that we have because they normally have large body size, a lot of them do. They have various kinds of conflicts with humans, and jaguars are no exception. Top predators are among the most threatened of all taxa. Jaguars are virtually extinct in some areas, or they're already extinct in over 50% of their original range and highly endangered in other areas. So we're trying to understand their population history better, their connectivity better, their adaptation to local environments in a deeper way. So as cool as it is to do these in-depth studies, I'm also fascinated by the unknown uh, aspects of biodiversity in, at, in a broader sense. So I've been involved with trying to survey biodiversity in various locations and trying to understand at least who's there. So the, the same strategy that we've been seeing across most of the talks, just surveying and understanding our biodiversity you know, in, in a minimum way before we lose it. And then we're losing it to a, you know, at, at a fast pace, as you know. So a few years ago, because of my involvement with uh, DNA methods and conservation biology, I was asked to give a talk uh, at a CBO regional meeting on how we can use uh, DNA barcodes to aid in biodiversity conservation. So I'll just enumerate uh, briefly the ideas that I 
to win at that time. And of course, they have been expanded on considerably since then. And, and during this conference, we've seen all of them be uh, explored in detail. But basically, what I think we, I still think we basically can put them into these categories. We can gather data on components of native biodiversity, including baseline data and then monitoring. Baseline data includes everything from knowing who's there, so inventorying the species, looking at community composition and dynamics, looking at geographic distribution. In the case of mammals, you might expect them to be fairly well known, but they actually aren't. Most mammals, we really don't know where they occur, where the original range is. A lot of them have been so impacted by human activities that we will never know probably where they originally ranged because they've already been extirpated in many areas. So knowing as much as possible of, ba of baseline geographic distribution, trophic interactions, and many other aspects. And as this is important, of course, it will then be important to use this information to monitor changes in community composition and in all these other aspects. Then, of course, we can gather data on threats, such as invasive species, pathogens, track uh, paths of illegal wildlife trafficking, and other such approaches. And then a more applied situation in which we help enforce actions uh, to curb these threats, such as in wildlife forensic analysis. And I'll try to touch on a few of these things during the talk. All of these applications are even more pressing in a country like Brazil. So this is just a general introductory slide to Brazil. So here it is, uh, occupies a large portion of South America. It's the fifth largest country in the world, sixth largest population in the world. So the area and population are here. Um, it's very diverse, so it's a, one of the leaders in, in biodiversity as far as has been estimated for most groups. So it's, since nobody really knows how many species are there anywhere, it's hard to, to count this uh, with any precision. But there's an estimate that Brawley referred to a few days ago that was published 10 years ago using extrapolation analysis and bootstrapping based on groups that are moderately well known. They estimated about 1.8 million species in Brazil. And that was on average 13% of the world's total. The confidence interval went from 10 to 17% of the world's total harbored in Brazil. But a fraction of that is known, a small fraction. We don't even know if it, this is not a conservative estimate. It probably is, because it's extrapolating from known ratios in other areas. And it, probably the ratio of unknown taxa to known taxa is higher in a hyper-diverse region than in other areas. So it's probably even above that. So given what we have in our official list, this is from the website of our Ministry of the Environment, you have about uh, uh, 120,000 invertebrates and about 9,000 vertebrate species. I just put them in red because I'm going to mostly talk about these groups. This is the group that I've focused on for barcode in the tetrapods, mammals, birds, non-avian reptiles, and amphibians, and lots and lots of fish. And as you can imagine, even more, way more, maybe 10 times more than the 120,000 vertebrate species that are officially known. So the task of inventorying this is, is huge. It's daunting. Uh, and the list keeps growing. So as Braulio mentioned uh, a few days ago, uh, we have a very active taxonomic community. So we have species being described daily, pretty much, across all you know, uh, plant and animal and microbial groups. We have even large mammals being described. Just the last few years, we've seen a new species of tapir. That's 2013. A new species of river dolphin described in 2014. And our own group has recently revalidated a new species of cat in 2013. So even large mammals are being described uh, fairly frequently. And new birds, reptiles, lots and lots of invertebrates. There's a backlog of species to describe with every taxonomist you talk to in Brazil. So there's lots of description going on. But as people have been pointing out, this is not fast enough to really keep up with what's there and what we're losing. I'm going to take a brief uh, distraction here just to show you the story behind our recognition of this cat species, because I think it has some important implications for DNA barcode and that people should be aware of. And David Posada yesterday was pointing out some aspect that I think we should attend to. So this is a group of cats that I've been devoting a lot of energy to. It's genus Leopardus. This is from our paper in 2013. So this is a mitochondrial DNA haplotype network. So you see each, each different sequence is a circle. The size of the circle is proportional to its frequency. And the colors are the phenotypic assignment. So we have a blue species, Leopardus geoffroy, a green species, Leopardus colocolo. And we used to have a single species in red. Red was Leopardus tigrinus. It was a small spotted cat or tiger cat. These are animals from the northeast, from the Brazilian northeast that had not been sampled until this study. So we didn't know what was there, but morphologically, they are the same species as that. If you look at this haplotype network, and then each, uh, 
each little line here is a mutation, and then when you have lots of mutations, you have a number there. You see different clades, you see different groups. And you see, for example, a lot of hybridization between, well, let me move one forward. Let me now start calling the northeastern Tigrina orange, because we had to rename it. So this is the orange, which is the northeastern population of the same species. So when you now look at the, this is an Atlantic forest, it's a, it's a coastal species in Brazil. The red species and the blue species hybridize a lot, right? So the blue here are individuals with a blue phenotype and they have a red mitochondrial DNA. So just think about in terms of the fact that we can't use regular single locus DNA barcoding with these species, okay? So all the blue ones here are animals that are phenotypically blue and mitochondrial DNA of red. All the red ones here are phenotypically red with mitochondrial DNA of blue. So there's a rampant hybrid zone going on in southern Brazil between the blue species and the red species. Then when you look at the orange, all of the orange individuals have green mitochondrial DNA. So the green mitochondrial DNA, so this is the green clay, the clay that belongs to this species. Every single one of these individuals harbor mitochondrial DNA from this individual. Not, we haven't found a single example of its own mitochondrial DNA. So it's been completely introgressed from the green species into the orange species. And why am I calling the red, the red and the orange separate species? Well, the mitochondrial DNA, they're completely different, but this could be just the introgression process. If you look at other markers, and that's what we did, so we had X chromosome markers, Y chromosome markers, and autosomal microsatellites, and I'm gonna walk you through this real quick. At the, y, in the X chromosome, you also see the hybridization, so it's bi-directional, males and females of both species are involved. You have blue introgressing into red, and red introgressing into blue on the X and on the Y as well. Green is by itself, so green is not involved in such recent ongoing hybridization with anybody. And orange is by itself. The orange animals don't share any haplotype with anybody. So they don't seem to have any gene flow with red. Red and orange were supposed to be the same species, so it's a case of a cryptic cat species that we revalidated. And looking at the microsatellites, people haven't been showing that much uh, in this conference, but it's a, a very uh, well-known technique in terms of measuring introgression, measuring hybridization and population differentiation. Each individual here is a vertical line, and the amount of a given color is how much of its genome can be allocated to a cluster. So you see the green by itself, they are pure essentially with very little indication of introgression. The orange, again, by itself, that support us recognizing that as a separate species, and rampant admixture between blue and red. So I won't give you much more details, but basically a cautionary note that we should, in the medium term, the long term, move on to multi-locus barcoding. So of course it's very useful for a lot of the things we're doing, and we're doing it ourselves, but it's a first pass, and it really doesn't get at these more complicated scenarios. So this is a complex hybridization process. We've detected others in mammals, in large mammals. Other people are detecting them, so they're not that rare, and you really can't figure this out with a single mitochondrial marker. You have to use multiple loci. And so I stand by David Posada's argument yesterday that we should think about multi-locus analysis, at least when you're looking in depth. Of course, for surveys of what's there, I agree that a single marker does a good job and we can get at most of the diversity, but we don't get at the complicated patterns. And the complicated patterns like this one are not that rare. Okay, so that's just my cautionary note. And I'll go back to a broader perspective. So going back to Brazil, this is a map of the Brazilian biomes. So the different biomes recognized in Brazil. This is the Atlantic forest that I was telling you about. This is where the new species that we revalidated occurs. This is the red species and this is the orange species. They occur in different biomes and we're now studying them in detail. I'll try to get back at that later in terms of their feeding ecology, especially the red and blue. Blue is here and red is here and orange is here. So all of our biomes have very high biodiversity, high levels of endemism and high rate of destruction. So we're losing these habitats very quickly. This is just an example. This is the Atlantic forest. It used to occur all through this area, this coastal area of Brazil. Now it's been reduced to around 10% of its original range. Highly fragmented. Very few blocks of uh, continuous forest remain. So one of the things we've been doing is just trying to start surveys of what's out there. So because of Mark's talk and uh, nematode things, so I decided to put in this uh, little slide just to show you a very cool project that is not related to mammals, it's related to serving diversity in bromeliad tank water. So this, we have a research station right here. So I'm, my university is right here in southern Brazil. We have a research station, about 3,000 hectares, that I'm trying to promote as a DNA barcoding, you know, place that we can really survey its diversity. 
So this is a, just a picture of the place. Two bromeliad species, and they're basically using metabarcoding to survey what's there. This is just, I've just put in one figure with phylum level. These are the top 20 phyla, eukaryotic phyla that we found. This is using 18S, and we're playing with CO1 as well. So here you see the nematodes. They're, they're there, there are plenty of nematodes. Uh, lots of interesting ciliates, lots of annelids. We even see that in the microscope. And there's lots of unidentified or unclassified eukaryotes. So we can, can't even get to phylum level in a lot of these uh, reads. So we're just starting to probe the diversity of Atlantic forest environments using uh, an environment that's very typical of the neutropics, the bromelia tank waters. Just another parenthesis, I'm gonna close it and go back then to our inventory. So we've been seeing that we have lots of diversity. We really can't keep up with describing it in traditional means. So we embraced DNA barcoding early on and we tried to organize a large scale effort to survey Brazilian biodiversity using DNA barcoding. We organized the first network in 2005 and we made a bold proposition to the Brazilian government to do a multi-center effort, in including all six large natural history museums, 14 centers of molecular biodiversity, which would be DNA barcoding facilities, and over 300 people. Our goal was to do 15 expeditions to the different biomes and collect 10,000 specimens in each, uh, at each location, focusing on groups that we had some better grasp on their taxonomy and that the diversity was not uh, intractable. So mostly vertebrates, spy one group of invertebrates and one group of plants, serving 10,000 specimens and barcoding all of them, so 150,000 specimens. This would be very good, but unfortunately the Brazilian government didn't think it was interesting enough and didn't fund it, so this never happened. Then, five years, we, did, we didn't give up. So we kept pressuring the Brazilian government and 10 years later, I, I mean five years later, in 2010, uh, with another group of people, a lot of overlapping people from the first effort, we finally launched what we call the BR Bowl uh, network with an initial large scale or larger scale uh, grant from the Brazilian government, from our Ministry of Science and Technology. We got about $3 million for this period of 2010, 2014. This is our website, so we have a, a uh, bold mirror, we have an informatics uh, facility. And so we got started. Uh, it was a remarkable network of people that got together. Uh, this is just an overview. We have about 500 people, but that's a guess because we really can't even count all the people involved at, at this point. Over 100 participating groups, all major Brazilian museums uh, and large collections got involved. We have a bioinformatics center that, led, that was led by Guilherme Oliveira, who's here at the conference. The network was chaired during this time by Claudio Oliveira, who's also here at the conference. So two of the other players in assembling this network are here. So it was fairly well distributed. Uh, we had an interesting uh, assemblage that not only joined natural history uh, folks, but a biomedical institution, Fiocruz, uh, which is an, a government uh, agency associated with the Ministry of Health that uh, was interested in barcoding its parasites and vectors uh, collections, so they joined our network. An agricultural research agency interested in biotechnology and crop development joined our network as well. And an interesting point is that the two largest museums, one in Rio and one in Sao Paulo, did not have their own molecular biology laboratories at the time. So we helped fund that using this grant. So we actually funded you know, the acquisition of equipment and the capacity building of uh, technicians and students at the two largest Brazilian natural history museums. And now they do have operational molecular biology laboratories doing a routine barcoding of their collections and uh, you know, specimens that come into the, the museum. So that was a good accomplishment of this first phase. This is just going through our, from, our net, from our website. You can see the different uh, projects. The grants were given to independent projects. There's a bioinformatics platform project. Uh, these are marine organisms, uh, plants, uh, fungi, uh, parasites and vectors. Two uh, initiatives uh, on invertebrates and four initiatives on vertebrates. And I'm just gonna briefly tell you about the projects that I led on tetrapods. So we had, I was leading the project on tetrapods and more particularly on mammals. But I, we have colleagues that led amphibians, reptiles, and birds. So I'm ju just gonna briefly run through what we've been doing in the first three years. So this is the tetrapod project. It was also very broad. It was a, one of the most decentralized of all the projects, which is a good thing and also a bad thing because it's hard to coordinate actions uh, happening across a huge area like this and different institutions with different capacities and different agendas, but we tried to do that. Uh, this, the colors indicate groups, laboratory generating barcode data for mammals, birds, non avian reptiles and amphibians. So you see some, some of them are more centralized like reptiles and amphibians and others are really decentralized like mammals. We had all four major natural history collections in Brazil. 
Uh, and then in the last couple years, French Guiana joined our mammal project. So now we have French Guiana as part of DR Ball as well on the mammal project. These are the data we collected so far. So about 13,000 barcodes from over 2,800 species. Um, it's a good number considering a lot of the challenges we faced, but it's a start because there's a lot more there and it's not as much as we want to achieve, so there's a lot more work ahead. I'm just going to showcase some examples uh, from amphibians and mammals. So amphibians are a very threatened group, a group that had been under represented in studies of various kinds and has now been receiving a lot of attention in terms of conservation because they're extremely endangered. So the amphibian group led by Mariana Lira, who was a postdoc of uh, Celio Haddad, barcoded about uh, 5,100 individuals, almost all of which are in bold already, spanning up over 400 species. And the spread is quite good. So they covered most of Brazil, especially the, the Atlantic forest. So I'm actually using more examples on the Atlantic forest, which is our most endangered biome. So for the Atlantic forest, they covered it quite well. This is pretty much the original uh, range of the Atlantic forest. They got 3,800 individuals, 71% of the known species, and 59 of the 63 genera. So that's a good starting point for actually serving and identifying unknown samples in, for example, surveys that are being performed uh, when deciding whether a hydroelectric plant will be built or another kind of power plant. So this is the kind of baseline data we need to actually survey quickly and reliably different areas. Three minutes. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> so for mammals, uh, just a few, a couple of slides just showing some of the geographic analysis we're performing. Um, I have a couple of slides where we have the bold location records for different IUCN categories and then how much we have tried to improve on that so that we cover the geographic breadth of some of these mammal species. So before we added our data, this is the, this is the way it looked for mammals that were data deficient. So those that are hard to assess in terms of their conservation status because they're categorized as data deficient. So we only had a couple of areas here in Brazil and a lot of effort more towards the northern end of South America. Then when we add the red, red are our records for mammals that are data deficient. So we were able to populate a little bit better the Brazilian diversity of mammals. And the blue are locations that we obtained for our barcodes that have not even been as assessed by IUCN yet. They're newly described taxa that are so poorly known that they are not even categorized as DD because they haven't been assessed by IUCN yet. If you look at the other categories, this is for vulnerable and near threatened. There were very few uh, records in bold that could be assessed and then improved on that using our network of people. And that's still just the beginning because a lot of the people have collected barcodes and they're still putting them into bold. This is just what has trickled into bold at this point. That's an ongoing process, getting all the coordinates and all the electropherograms and putting things into bold. People have been using that to identify diverse groups of mammals such as these sigmodontine rodents. So this is a paper that came out 2013. They are, several of them are reservoirs for zoonosis, for important diseases that the Brazilian Ministry of Health uh, is worried about and a lot of our health authorities are worried about. So barcoding works pretty well. So this is just a, a tree showing the different species, things that are really hard to identify based on morphology alone. You need karyotypes, lots of cryptic species. Barcoding generally does a good job. We developed a method to identify carnivores. We're using mini barcodes and we're using that in the field to identify scats. We're using barcodes to identify the prey of wildcats. It's just one of our own projects. We have a few students trying to understand the trophic relationships among cat species. And using our improved database, we can now identify things much better. This is a cat. It's not, not a very pretty image. It's a road-kill cat. We didn't kill the cat. We, have, we find the road-killed cats and then we get the, their stomachs out and get their prey items and then barcode the prey items to see what they ate. Because um, different from what people might expect, we don't know what cats eat. Actually, if you look into the literature, nobody really has a good idea of the species that wild cats eat anywhere. Perhaps in Europe, you have a, a little bit of an idea, or in North America, but in most of the world, we have wild cats or other carnivores whose diet we really don't know what it is. Okay? So we're trying to figure that out for Brazil. That's just an example. Just to tie it into the previous, like this is that blue species that hybridizes with the red. So now we're looking at their diets in the regions where they hybridize, trying to understand if the, their, they compete, if their trophic ecology changes in the hybrid zone and what it is like. So this is a nice uh, example because it ties in a cat that we study with an amphibian that Mariana Lira and Celio studied. That, it's one of those taxa that they improved a lot upon. It's an Atlantic forest frog that's now in their database. 
and now we can identify a prey item from the blue cat using the amphibians that our amphibian group has identified. And this interaction is unprecedented. We normally didn't have a mammal group and an amphibian group that know each other, that work together, much less a plant group, a fungal group, a fish group. So now we are interacting, and that's one of the major accomplishments uh, of this first phase of our project. Uh, just the red, this one example for the red species, this is a very hard to identify rodent. We generally got to genus level and use morphology. Now with barcodes, we generally get pretty good identifications. So we have lots of references from different areas of Brazil, and we can identify the prey items to species level with uh, considerable confidence. Uh, my last example is on uh, wildlife forensic. So my own lab and other labs have done some proof of concept studies, identifying mammals and birds. Uh, and now a, a good thing is that the Brazilian federal police uh, is using it uh, as a routine in the identification of uh, confiscated wildlife. Uh, I was talking to a federal police guy a couple days ago and he said, please thank the DNA barcoders for having invented this. That was, so I'm thanking the DNA barcoding community in the name of our Brazilian federal police because they said it's very useful. We now use bold a lot. We're now using it routinely to identify confiscated wildlife in Brazil. So that's a good thing to hear. And this is a well-publicized case. I think it's my last uh, example. This guy was arrested in 2003 with 58 eggs uh, attached to its body. He claimed they were quail eggs. And people tried to hatch the eggs. The eggs died. They didn't hatch. So they couldn't really convict the guy with, you know, with a really more severe penalty because they couldn't prove it was a wildlife species. So they used DNA barcoding uh, at the time. And this has just come out. Uh, this is a, one of the leaders of our barcoding group. It's the leader of our bird group. Christina Miyaki and her team, this just came out a, few a couple months ago, uh, but it, it was uh, a case from 2003. And so 57 were different parrot species, one was an owl species. So they managed to get to species level, and that helped convict the guy with a more uh, severe penalty. So last slide, good news. We got started, scratched the surface of Brazilian biodiversity with barcoding. An unprecedented community of biodiversity scientists has been assembled and we're now much more integrated than we were. There's capacity in the country and it's a good, there's a good prospect of moving forward. Challenges include securing continuous large scale funding, improving governance and organizational structure of the network and scaling up and speeding up because the magnitude of the task is sheerly high. So I'd like to thank my funders with mostly CNPQ, our National Research Council. This is our, our network also funded by CNPQ people in the network that were instrumental for making it happen, in the yellow people in my lab working on these various projects I talked about. This is for the Bromelia metabarcoding, and thank you very much. <laughs>